The 30th of September, 1888, was the night of the double event when Elizabeth Stride was murdered in Burner Street off Commercial Road and Catherine Eddowes was murdered in Mitre Square on the eastern fringe of the City of London. It was in the aftermath of these murders that the police released a letter which had been received by the Central News Agency on New Bridge Street in the City of London on the 27th of September. This was the infamous Dear Boss letter that taunted the police and bore the chilling signature, Jack the Ripper. Thereafter, the murderer had gained a name that would catapult him into the realm of legend and which would afford five sordid East End murders international notoriety. It is doubtful that the letter was actually written by the killer. In fact, the probability is that it was written by a journalist. However, from that point on, the perpetrator of the Whitechapel atrocities would become universally known as Jack the Ripper, and it would be almost impossible to separate the author of the letter, i.e. Jack the Ripper, from the actual miscreant who was carrying out a reign of terror on the streets of Whitechapel. In this video, I'm going to just look at the events from the evening of Saturday the 29th of September through to the early hours of Sunday the 30th of September and follow both Elizabeth Stride and Catherine Eddowes through what would prove to be the final hours of their lives. Elizabeth Stride spent the last afternoon of her life cleaning rooms in the lodging house at 32 Flower and Dean Street where she had lived on and off for the previous six years. The deputy keeper, Elizabeth Tanner, paid her sixpence for the chores, and by 6.30pm, Elizabeth was slaking her thirst in this pub, the Queen's Head, which stood, and still stands, at the junction of fashion and commercial streets. By 7pm, she had returned to the lodging house, and was, according to fellow resident Charles Preston, from whom she borrowed a clothes brush, dressed, ready to go out. Having chatted briefly with another lodger, Catherine Lane, Liz Stride left the lodging house at around 7.30pm. It rained heavily that night, and at 11pm, Jay Best and John Gardner saw her sheltering in the doorway of the Bricklayer's Arms on Settle Street. She was in the company of a man who was about 5 feet 5 inches tall. According to Best, they did not appear willing to go out. He was hugging and kissing her, and as he seemed a respectably dressed man, we were rather astonished at the way he was going on with the woman. The two men couldn't resist a little light-hearted banter at the couple's expense, and remarked to the woman, Watch out, that's leather apron getting round you. Embarrassed by the chaffing, the couple went off like a shot. At some stage in the next 45 minutes, Elizabeth Stride made her way to nearby Burner Street, a thoroughfare that was lined with two-storey houses. A little way along, on the right-hand side, were the gates into Dutfield Yard, a narrow court which was lined on its right side by the wall of the International Working Men's Educational Club, and on its left side by the wall of No. 42 Burner Street, behind which was a row of cottages. On this particular Saturday, about a hundred people had crammed into the club to debate the topic, why Jews should be socialists. The meeting broke up at around 11.30pm, and the majority of the members headed home. About a dozen people, however, stayed on and gathered in the upstairs room, where they either chatted or started singing. Louis Deemschutz, the club steward, had gone out that day to hawk jewellery at Crystal Palace, but his wife, who lived with him on the premises, was overseeing proceedings. At around 11.40pm, William Marshall, a labourer who lived at 64 Burner Street, was standing outside his lodging when he noticed a man and woman outside number 63. They both seemed quite sober, and as he watched them, they began to kiss. Marshall heard the man remark to the woman, You would say anything but your prayers. The couple then moved off, heading in the direction of Dutfield Yard. At 12.30am, PC William Smith proceeded along Burner Street on his beat and noticed a man and a woman on the opposite side of the road to Dutfield Yard. The woman, whom Smith later identified as Elizabeth Stride, had a flower pinned to her jacket. However, the couple were doing nothing to arouse Smith's suspicion, so he continued on his beat to Commercial Road. The most important witness to have possibly seen Elizabeth Stride in the hours leading up to her murder was a Hungarian Jew by the name of Israel Schwartz. He turned into Burner Street at around 12.45am and noticed a man walking ahead of him. 
the man stopped to talk to a woman who was standing in the gateway of Duckfield Yard. Later, Schwartz identified the woman as having been Elizabeth Stride. As Schwartz watched, the man tried to pull the woman into the street, but then spun her around and threw her onto the footway, whereupon the woman screamed three times, but not very loudly. Israel Schwartz apparently believed that he was witnessing a domestic argument, so he crossed the road to avoid getting involved. As he did so, he saw a second man standing lighting his pipe. As Schwartz passed him, the man who was attacking the woman called out the word Lipsky, apparently to this second man, at which point the second man began to follow him. Schwartz panicked and began to run, and managed to lose his pursuer by the time he reached the nearby railway arch. At 1am, Louis Diemschutz returned to the International Working Men's Educational Club and turned his pony and cart into Duckfield Yard. As he did so, the pony shied left and refused to go any further. Looking into the yard, Diemschutz saw a dark shape lying on the ground close to the wall of the club. Leaning forward, he prodded it with his whip and tried to lift it. When this proved unsuccessful, he jumped down to investigate and struck a match to get a better view. It was windy that night, and the match was extinguished almost immediately, but in the brief seconds of flickering light, he saw it was a woman lying on the ground. For some reason, he thought it was his wife, and so he went into the club by the side entrance to see if she was there. Finding her safe, he told several club members, There's a woman lying in the yard, but I cannot say whether she is drunk or dead. Taking a candle, Diemschutz returned to the yard with several club members. Now he noticed blood by the body, and those present saw to their horror that the woman's throat had been cut. They had discovered the body of Jack the Ripper's third victim, Elizabeth Stride. However, the Whitechapel murderer had not finished on this night. At almost exactly the same time as Elizabeth Stride's body was being discovered in Duckfield Yard, another woman named Catherine or Kate Eddowes was being released from Bishopsgate Police Station in the City of London. At around 8.30pm on the evening of the 29th of September, she had been entertaining a delighted crowd of onlookers outside 29 Allgate High Street with a spontaneous, though drunken, imitation of a fire engine. Having taken a bow, she lay down on the pavement and went to sleep. P.C. Robinson of the city police arrived on the scene and asked if any of the onlookers knew who the woman was and where she lived. None of them did, so Robertson hauled her to her feet and leant her against the wall. She promptly slid back down onto the pavement. Robinson summoned a colleague, P.C. George Simmons, and together they manhandled her round to Bishopsgate Police Station. Here, when asked her name, Kate replied, Nothing. The officers placed her in a cell and left her to sober up. She had soon fallen fast asleep. George Hutt, the city jailer, came on duty at 10pm and took over responsibility for the prisoners in the cells. He checked on her several times over the next few hours and found her fast asleep. By 12.15am, though, she had woken and Hutt heard her singing softly. A quarter of an hour later, she called to him and asked when she would be allowed to leave. "'When you can take care of yourself,' Hutt called back. "'I can do that now,' came her reply. At 12.55 a.m., he brought her from the cell and told her she could go. When asked her name and address for the release papers, she replied, Mary Ann Kelly of 6 Fashion Street. Discharging her from custody, Hutt pushed open the swing door to the passage and said, This way, missus. As she walked along the passage to the outer door, she asked him what the time was. Too late for you to get any more drink, observed Hutt. I shall get a damn fine hiding when I get home, she sighed as she opened the door. Hutt was not in the least bit sympathetic. And serve you right, he replied. You have no right to get drunk. As Kate left the station, Hutt asked her to shut the door behind her. All right, she chirped. Good night, old cock. So saying, she made her way down this narrow passage, Rose Alley, turned left along Bishopsgate, and made her way towards Houndsditch. Mitre Square, situated about half a mile to the west of Burner Street, lies just inside the City of London boundary. It was then an enclosed square, over which towered three imposing warehouse buildings. The square was bordered by Mitre Street to the west, Orgate High Street to the south, and Duke's Place to the east. 
there were three entrances to the square, a fairly wide one that came in from Mitre Street, the narrower St. James's Place, known locally as the Orange Market, in the northeast corner, and the long, narrow church passage in the southeast corner that came in from Duke's Place. At 1.30 that morning, three friends, Joseph Lavender, Harry Harris, and Joseph Hyam Levy, left the Imperial Club, a members club for local businessmen situated on Duke's Place. Making their way towards Allgate High Street, they passed the church passage entrance into Mitre Square at around 1.35. Joseph Lavender was walking a short distance ahead of his colleagues. As they approached the turn into church passage, they saw a man and a woman standing under the gas lamp above its entrance. The woman had her back to the trio, so they were unable to see her face, but Lavender would later identify her by her clothes and say that it was almost certainly Catherine Eddowes. Levy also saw the couple and commented to Harris, Here, I'm off. I don't like the look of those people over there. I don't like going home by myself at this hour of the morning. I don't like passing this class of persons. The three men walked on towards their respective homes, none of them looking back at the couple. In addition to noting the woman's clothing, Lavender also took note of the man and was able later to give the police a fairly detailed description of him. Just before 1.45, Constable Watkins of the City Police turned out of Leadenhall Street, strolled along Mitre Street and veered right into Mitre Square. Glancing right towards the square's southwest corner, he saw a dark shape lying on the ground. Approaching, he shone his bullseye lantern onto it and saw a sight that sent him reeling back in horror. Lying there on the ground was the horrifically mutilated body of Catherine Eddowes. Racing across the square, Watkins burst into Keely and Tong's warehouse, where he knew that a retired policeman, George Morris, was working as a night watchman. "'For God's sake, mate!' cried Watkins. "'Come to my assistance. Here is another woman cut to pieces!' Pausing to get his lamp, the night watchman followed Watkins to the square's southwest corner, took one look at the body, and raced off along Mitre Street towards Allgate, blowing furiously on his whistle as he ran. Police officers were soon converging on Mitre Square from all over the city. Inspector Edward Collard arrived from Bishopsgate Police Station and ordered an immediate search of the neighbourhood, instructing that door-to-door -door inquiries were to be made around Mitre Square. Next on the scene was Superintendent James McWilliam, head of the City Police Detective Department, who arrived with a number of detectives, all of whom he sent off to make a thorough search of the Spitalfield streets and lodging houses. As the officers began to fan out through the streets, several men were stopped and questioned, but to no avail. The killer, it appeared, had simply melted away into the darkness. It is probable that he made his escape via the adjacent St. James's Place, where there was a metropolitan fire escape station. Yet the firemen on duty had seen and heard nothing at all. Neither had City Police Constable Richard Pierce, who lived at No. 3 Mitre Square, where his bedroom window looked across at the murder site. George Morris, the night watchman, whose whistle had first alerted the police at large to the atrocity, expressed himself totally baffled as to how such a brutal crime could have been committed close by without him hearing a sound. As the Illustrated Police News reported, he could hear the footsteps of the policeman as he passed on his beat every quarter of an hour, so that it appeared impossible that the woman could have uttered any sound without his detecting it. It was only on the night that he remarked to some policeman that he wished the butcher would come round Mitre Square and he would give him a doing. Yet the butcher had come and he was perfectly ignorant of it. Stranger still, at the exact moment that Catherine Eddowes was entering Mitre Square with her murderer, three city detectives, Daniel House, Robert Outram and Edward Marriott, were busily orchestrating plain-clothes patrols of the city's eastern fringe yet the murderer had managed to slip past them undetected. Hulse was over by St. Botolph's Church when he learnt of the murder just before 2am. Hurrying to Mitre Square, he gave instructions to the constables present to search the neighbourhood. He then set off to make his own search, heading first to Middlesex Street and from there to Wentworth Street, where he stopped to question two men. Both were able to give him a satisfactory account of their movements and he allowed them to continue on their way. He then passed through Goulston Street at around 2.20am, where he noticed nothing untoward and headed back to Mitre Square. Here he found that the body had been removed to the Golden Lane Mortuary, over to which he then headed. 
On his way there, he learnt that a portion of the deceased's apron was missing and was presumed to have been taken by her killer. At around 2.55am, PC Alfred Long of the Metropolitan Police, one of the extra constables drafted into the area after the Annie Chapman murder, was walking his beat here along Goulston Street. As he passed the doorway that led to the staircases of 108 to 119 Wentworth model dwellings on the right here, he found the missing portion of the woman's apron. It was stained with blood and other matter. One section of it was wet and the blade of a knife had evidently been wiped on it. Long had earlier passed that way at roughly 2.20am, about the same time as Hulse, but like the city detective, he too had seen nothing to attract his attention. Indeed, he was sure that the fragment had not been there then. The killer had evidently used the piece of apron to clean himself up and wipe the blade of his knife. Long's first thought on discovering the portion of apron was that someone may have been attacked and could at that very moment be lying injured or dead on a staircase or landing inside the dwellings. So he stood up, intending to search the block. As he did so, he noticed a scrawled chalk message on the wall directly above the apron, which read, The Jews are the men that will not be blamed for nothing. The word Jews was spelt J-U-W-E-S, or J-U-E-W-S, or J-E-W-E-S, or various other spellings that were remembered by different police officers. Moments later, another officer arrived at the scene, and Long asked him to guard the building, telling him to keep a careful watch on anybody entering or leaving it, whilst he took the portion of apron round to Commercial Street Police Station and handed it over to an inspector. Soon, officers of the Metropolitan Police were gathering around the doorway and were gazing at the graffito with great trepidation. Mindful of the anti-Semitism that had surfaced in the area in the wake of the leather apron scare, and realising that Wentworth model dwellings not only stood in a largely Jewish locality, but were also inhabited almost exclusively by Jews, the Metropolitan Police began to fear that if the message was left, it could lead to a resurgence of anti-Semitism in the district, with dire consequences. They were therefore anxious to erase the message sooner rather than later but both the portion of apron and the graffito pertain to a murder investigation now being carried out by the City of London Police, detectives from which had soon crossed the boundary and were also gathering around the doorway. They were not keen to erase what they saw as an important clue, and the two forces clashed over what should be done. The City Police were adamant that it should be photographed, the Metropolitan Police pointed out that this would mean waiting until it was light, by which time Gentiles would be arriving in their thousands to purchase from the Jewish stallholders at the Petticoat Lane and Goulston Street Sunday markets. Since there was no way of keeping it hidden from these crowds, the Metropolitan Police feared that a full-scale anti-Jewish riot might result. Daniel House suggested a compromise whereby only the top line, the Jews are, would be erased. But as Superintendent Arnold of the Metropolitan Police later pointed out in a report, had only a portion of the writing been removed, the context would have remained. The bickering was still going on when Sir Charles Warren arrived at the scene between 5am and 5.30am. Because the doorway stood on Metropolitan Police territory, his word was final, and he immediately concurred with his officers that leaving the graffito any longer would almost certainly lead to far greater crimes against innocent Jews so he ordered that the message be erased without delay and before any photograph of it could be taken. It would prove one of the most controversial orders he gave in the entire investigation. Major Smith, the acting City of London Police Commissioner, considered it a huge blunder and could barely disguise his contempt for Warren's actions. However, Given the anti-Semitism that the leather apron scare had generated in the district, the fears of the Metropolitan Police were probably justified. Erasing the graffito, however questionable, probably did prevent the mob from once more venting their anger on innocent Jewish scapegoats, and given that several of the officers who saw it said that it looked faded as though it had been there for some time, so the possibility remains that it was left over graffito from the leather apron scare and had nothing to do with the night of the double murder, it being a pure coincidence that the killer of Catherine Eddowes chose to leave the portion of her apron in the same doorway. As dawn broke on the 30th of September, the Whitechapel murderer had carried out two murders and had succeeded in humiliating two police forces, leaving their senior officers baffled and bickering.
as word of a double event crackled around the metropolis, excited and agitated crowds flocked to the murder sites to speculate on the killer's motives and identity. Burner Street was said to have been packed with a sea of heads from end to end, whilst the streets surrounding Mitre Square were blocked by ghoulish spectators. The murders were rapidly assuming a distinct air of melodrama, and on the 1st of October, the actions of the Metropolitan Police saw to it that the gruesome pantomime was given a villain that would ensure that it would run and run by making public the Dear Boss Letter. And from that point on, the Whitechapel murderer became universally known as Jack the Ripper. <laughs>